All right, a couple of few people still trickling in. Uh, I am, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the opening spiel here. So hi again, everybody. This is uh, Larry Eames and welcome to the Help, I'm an Accidental Government Document or Government Information Librarian webinar series or HELP for short. Um, the series is brought to you by the American Library Association's Government Documents Roundtable. And thank you all so much for coming. Um, you should all be muted, but in case you aren't, please keep your mute, please mute your audio during the presentation by you know, clicking on that audio icon next to your name, turn it red. Uh, we encourage you to participate in the chat throughout the webinar and to leave questions in the Q&A. If you don't see your chat window, click on the chat icon now. It should be at the kind of the bottom of your screen and open it up that way. Um, you can also drag the edge of the box to expand it. Um, if there are technical issues, Sam Hagar, who has just dropped in the chat, is on hand to help. Please feel free to chat with her or, you know, worst case scenario, remember that the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we have plans for upcoming webinars. Uh, in October, we'll be joined by Elizabeth Hayden to talk about the vital statistics system. And if you have topic ideas or if you would like to present, go ahead and let me know. I'm going to go ahead and drop my email in the chat as well. You can see more of our webinars on our YouTube channel. And if you are a YouTube user, go ahead and give us a follow over there. Uh, so without further ado, today's webinar is tips and, tips and Tricks for New Government Documents Librarians. Caitlin Tannis is the History and Social Sciences Librarian and Government Documents Librarian at the University of Delaware Library, Museums and Press. Caitlin received her BA in History and Anthropology from Susquehanna University in 2015. She has a MA in Public History from, uh, from New York University and an MLIS from Long Island University. Prior to arriving at the University of Delaware in 2019, Caitlin worked for a small public library in Northern New Jersey as the adult program coordinator. She was also the ship's librarian for SUNY Maritime College. Uh, everyone give Caitlin a warm welcome. Caitlin, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Larry. Uh, and hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I'm gonna just take a, a few seconds to just share my screen and pull up my own slides. One moment while I, I toggle. All right, hopefully everyone uh, can see this. Um, if not, please let me know. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I, I, when I was signing in earlier, I mentioned that this is actually a really big um, honor for me. Um, I love the HELP webinar series, um, which I will probably talk a little bit more about today since that um, did help me a lot actually within my first year being a government documents librarian. So this is really exciting for me. Um, I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with you after my presentation. Um, and I'm sure there are also people here on the line who have their own tips and tricks um, and their own helpful advice for new government documents librarians. So I'm really eager to, to hear from you as well. Um, so hopefully if you have any advice or um, if anything that I say resonates with you, um, please, please chime in. Um, I'd really like to, to learn myself from everyone who's on, on the call. So um, our agenda for today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my institution, of course, just to give you a little bit of a background of where I'm working and where I'm coming from. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit more about the reflections and, and tips that I have for my first year as a government documents librarian, kind of what helped me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about research questions and how I typically navigate them um, and what I had hoped that I had time for in the year, but just did not happen um, and what goals I have for the next year. So um, a little bit about, about me before I officially begin. Um, I am the History and Social Sciences Librarian at the University of Delaware. I have um, been at UD for about um, two and a half years at this point. So I was hired in 2019 um, and I was originally hired um, for reference and instructional services, which is the part, department that I, I um, serve in and work in. Um, so I work specifically with the history department, the political science and international relations department. So that's what I was hired initially um, and what I came in as, but um, since I've uh, also taken on government documents as well as the Biden School for Public Policy and Administration. Um, and I also work with uh, smaller programs like legal studies, which is a minor at UD, um, and then the Center for Area and Global Studies. 
So a little bit about the University of Delaware. Um, we're located in Newark, Delaware. Um, it is spelled the same way as Newark, New Jersey, but we are pronounced different, so it's Newark. Um, it used to be two separate words at one point in time. Um, it's located in Northern Delaware. It's about uh, 40 minutes or so from Philadelphia um, and about, uh, about 20 minutes or so from the city of Wilmington. So we're pretty um, central at the top. Um, we have a, a little over 23, thousand students and that ranges from undergraduate to graduate students. Um, we also have a, a very strong professional and continuing studies program um, that happens in the state. So it, we have a lot of people who are coming back um, uh, to school. Um, and so it's really interesting because we always get a, a really wonderful mix of uh, people um, at our institution. Um, it's a common misconception that the University of Delaware is a state school. We actually are not. We are state assisted, but we're privately governed. Uh, so we are not the official state university um, of the, the state. Um, and we also are a land, sea, and space grant university. So a little bit about the library. Our official name is the University of Delaware Library Museums and Press. Um, we have about uh, over 2 million uh, print books and over 500,000 electronic titles. Of course, during the pandemic, um, that number shot up through the roof uh, because of the nature of, of online learning, of course. Um, we do have four branch libraries. Um, the first three that you see on the screen, so the Education Resource Center, the Chemistry Library, and the Physics Library are all located on um, our Newark campus, but the last library is actually on a satellite campus in Lewis. Delaware, which is about an hour and a half or so um, from our campus. So it's a marine studies based um, section of our university. Um, we also have four special collections and museum galleries um, on our campus, um, and they are connected with the library and run through the library. Um, our special collections, I do just want to take note, um, we have a very um, large collection of different government uh, public or um, special collections material that's related to government information. So a, a lot of our politicians in the state of Delaware um, are alumni of the university. So they typically like to donate their papers um, at the end of their political career, kind of halfway through their political career. Um, so of course we have the Biden papers um, and we also have um, uh, Tom Carper's uh, go uh, government um, I'm sorry, governor uh, uh, papers as well. So um, we have quite a, a rich collection of government materials. So in terms of our government documents collection itself, um, we are a member of the Federal Depository Library Program, so FDLP, and we have been a member um, since uh, 1897. So our 120th anniversary, or 25th anniversary is coming up this next year. Um, we also are a repository for state documents uh, within the state of Delaware. So we have quite a lot of um, uh, collections that are on microfilm um, that are typically found at Delaware Public Archives, um, but we have copies of them at our institution. Um, we also work with the Patent Trade Trademark Resource Center Program. So in terms of our, our physical collection and our government documents collection, um, we have a, our collections kind of spread out in a, a number of different locations. Um, we, our print collection is actually in our annex location, which is on campus, but it's just in a separate building. Um, that decision to move our entire print collection was actually done by my predecessor. So it was one of the last decisions that he made before passing it on to me. Um, we do have a microform that includes a lot of microfiche um, as well as some microfilm and um, we also have some additional you know, DVDs and CDs as well in our collection that's located on the lower level of the library. Um, and we also have quite a number of different um, maps that we've gotten through FDLP as well as other government publications on the lower level as well. Um, and then of course the bulk of our collection is really our electronic documents, um, which we have cataloged um, in our um, catalog called Delcat Discovery. Um, so of course, it's right now over 500,000 and counting because we do, of course, gets updated every couple of weeks. So that's just to give you a snapshot of kind of what I work with um, on a daily basis. But now let's get into kind of the, the actual meat of the of the program. And I'm going to keep checking my my clock to make sure that I'm I'm running on time. Okay, so uh, government documents, librarianship. So I um, 
like I said, I was not hired as a government documents librarian. I came in um, with other responsibilities, but um, because of the pandemic, um, which I'm sure has happened at all of your institutions, um, we've had a number of retirements at the University of Delaware. Um, and one of those retirements was our government documents librarian who had been working with this particular collection um, for over 30 years, if I'm, if I'm remembering the number correctly. Um, what was nice about um, having someone announce their retirement um, was that it gave us a chance to kind of think through, well, who, who should get this responsibility? Um, what, where does it make sense, essentially, in, in our library? Um, and because I was working with the political science and international relations department, um, I kind of basically named myself um, as the person who I think should have taken over government documents. Um, and thankfully my, my supervisors uh, agreed with me. Um, I didn't really have that much experience with government documents. I kind of knew how to stumble my way around research questions, um, but I did have practice in that previous year of trying to answer government documents related questions. So I was constantly in conversation with our government documents librarian at the time. Um, so it, it felt like a logical choice to name me as, as this person um, and take over after the retirement. Um, what was really nice was that uh, we were able to actually have some training sessions before he officially left. Um, so I definitely was very lucky because I did learn a lot um, and try and at least soak up as much as I could before um, John Stevenson as the, the previous government documents librarian, um, before John Stevenson officially left our library and, and went into retirement. Um, and thankfully, he still is a very active colleague of mine. So if I'm ever in a pinch, um, I can always email him and he'll um, actually answer my questions, which is really quite lovely. And I think it's it's definitely a privilege that I still have access to um, someone who has that type of institutional knowledge. Um, but um, the downside of becoming a government documents librarian in 2020 was of course the pandemic. Um, so I was learning everything completely online um, and I wasn't able to actually see our physical collection before it was moved over. So I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a few moments, um, but the pandemic of course had a slew of different challenges that all of us ex experienced, um, but this kind of added a different layer when I was trying to learn a new collection when I couldn't actually be in the building with the collection. So that's a little bit about how I became a government documents librarian. So again, I've been um, uh, in the position for about a year now. Um, and so as I was reflecting and thinking a little bit more about what helped me over the course of the year, um, I've kind of have a, a number of things laid out on the slide. So I'm going to go through and kind of elaborate on each one. So I apologize for all the, the wording on there, but um, I'll explain all of them in, in, in due time. Um, so the first thing that was actually not something that I even realized that I had experience with, but what really helped me, my predecessor when we were in, in training, he said to me, you know, I really think you would, you're going to be great at this job because you already have an understanding of the structure of our government. You already have a historical understanding. Um, you know where things live. That's going to give you a leg up when trying to answer these research questions that are going to come your way. Um, and as I was thinking about it, he was, he was absolutely right. Um, I think knowing just the basic structure of how our government operates, knowing some of the departments and agencies, knowing when things are supposed to technically shuffle into other institutions and officially be a part of the National Archives, knowing what things are published um, is really, really helpful. So just having a basic knowledge of the structure of our government is already going to give you a leg up. And I wanted to especially emphasize that today because I think, especially in new positions where you're kind of thrown into it and you're not quite sure what is involved. I think knowing that you have prior knowledge about this is really important and it's something that you should remind yourself and kind of give yourself a little bit more confidence with that. Um, and if you don't know everything that you think that you should know, that's totally okay. There's, again, tons of different resources out there that you can basically up your knowledge in areas that you think that you need help with. And I've definitely um, done that uh, this past year. 
The other thing that really, really helped me as um, a new government documents librarian was, was going through and answering old research questions. Um, it was so vital for me um, to just have the, this hands-on practical experience of trying to navigate all of the government resources and figure out what is this person asking? Is this available? Where is it available? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about you know, how I usually go through research questions in, in just a second on the next slide. Um, but going through and, and actually trying my hand at answering these research questions that came in previously, and then seeing my predecessor's answers um, were really helpful. Um, we work with the Springshare system. So um, most of that was recorded in some way. Um, we usually have like a little section that where we put in what the question was. Um, but also, again, I was very privileged in being able to actually talk to my predecessor and say, hey, I see you answered this question. This is how I answered it. Does this, does this make sense? Um, so I really encourage you, if, if you don't have access to those old research questions, um, maybe you can ask the reference librarians um, and see if anyone has ever encountered a research question that they um, have had to pass on to the government documents librarian. Um, just try and, and, and find some practical way that you could actually practice um, getting at this information. Um, it, it really, really, it just was invaluable to me. And I think all of us as librarians are kind of, um, we're kind of used to not always necessarily knowing how to do something until we've actually physically do it. There's so many different subjects that I'm not an expert in, but I could definitely stumble my way through a research question and help someone. So I, I really encourage you to, to try that. Um, the next thing that I did, and this took up a really big bulk of my, of my first year, um, was that I inherited about four um, research guides uh, from my predecessor. And this was actually between two different people um, so we did have someone who used to be in the reference department who also worked with government documents in addition to John Stevenson. Um, so the two of them had created these very long and extensive research guides that had just a wealth of information. Um, but I, I thought they were um, a little bit hard to navigate just as, a, as someone who is more of a visual person. There's a lot of information on there. It was a little bit overwhelming. So I decided that I wanted to create new research guides um, for our government information. So I've actually whittled it down to two. Um, so I have a government information and congressional publications guide, and then I also have a government legal information guide. Um, so those are the two that I've been able to condense down a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, I also have a census guide, so I have three. Um, but going through those research guides, first of all, you know, our, my predecessor was highlighting specific collections, highlighting specific things that were um, important at the University of Delaware for what we specifically had and were collecting. Um, and they were highlighting where things were um, and also how the helpful tips and tricks that we like to provide for researchers. So me going through those research guides were really, really important. Uh, because I was able to see what my predecessor had previously done without having a physical conversation with them, right? I was able to go through and, and basically kind of follow the logic um, of why they included specific resources where I was able to cut out some things that I'm like, you know what, I really don't think that that's important information. One of the research guides had basically all of the links to every single department and agency that was at the that was in the government. Um, and I, I felt like that was a little bit unnecessary for you know the age of search engines that we that we essentially live in right now. Um, so going through those guides and really cleaning them up helped me a lot to understand um, the types of questions that I usually get um, and and the types of things that we have at our, at the university. The other thing which you're already doing um, is attending webinars. I attended so many. I went back into the very vast archive of the HELP series um, and I watched a ton of them. Um, and I start, actually had started doing this when I took on the political science department um, just to make sure that I was up to date with how um, government information was, was um, being presented. Some, and I really was interested in hearing other experts in the field. So I really encourage you to 
go back uh, through those webinar series. I know that time is, is very limited, but kind of strategically pick um, the ones that are, are going to help you the most. Um, likewise, when I was asked a research question, um, I would actually go back through the webinar series and see if there was um, a particular one that would help me answer a particular research question. So it took me a little bit longer um, to, of course, get back to that person, but I felt like I was trying to um, properly educate myself to better answer that research question. I think in the, in the long run and expanded my knowledge um, a lot on, on other areas that I probably wouldn't have um, encountered if I had just tried to kind of stumble my way through the, the research question. Um, and of course, if you're an FDLP member, um, but also just a government, there's a whole bunch of um, webinars through GovInfo um, that are free that you can sign up for. Um, I frequently also pass them on to my colleagues who might have to kind of um, be the gatekeeper to some of the government information questions. Uh, so um, before it comes to me, it might be asked of them. So at least I can get a, a little bit of a head start for our patrons and our researchers. Um, so there's a ton out there. Um, I don't really spend that much time talking about the FDLP program in this presentation. Um, I can, of course, talk a little bit more about it in the, the Q&A portion of this, but um, especially with some of the um, things that we're expected to do in FDLP, like making sure our collection is up to date, um, every single year, the FDLP Academy, um, the FDLP webinars were really, really helpful for kind of those process questions um, of how do I navigate the system, this FDLP system. So the last two points, um, I'm going to very quickly go over. Um, so first of all, this is something that I did when I actually started my job at the University of Delaware. Um, I reached out to other government documents librarians um, in the area um, or who had jobs that I knew were similar to me just based on, you know, job descriptions and um, just based on um, their subject listings that they had on their research guides um, uh, profile pages. So I actually reached out to a number of government documents librarians, including um, our uh, regional librarian um, who works at the University of Maryland. So I reached out to her as well, just kind of talk with them and, and to ask them questions about, you know, what did you wish um, you had known before you had started in your government documents position? Um, you know, what are the things that, that have really helped you over the course of your career? Um, and that kind of helped me figure out what skills I needed to build um, and, and what really I was lacking in my knowledge base. So I encourage you to, to have those, those conversations. Honestly, um, I was never told no. <laughs> I was never turned down. Um, so I, I think you, everyone in our profession is very helpful and, and um, willing to um, help someone who's a little bit younger in their career, or younger in a particular position. So I really encourage you to, to try and, and make connections. Um, and they're also really just important if you, um, you know, have questions or, or need um, a, a colleague for future publications or, or presentations. It's nice to, to network a little bit. Um, I also was really fortunate that I had signed up for the RUSA History Section Mentorship Program kind of right as I was starting um, my government documents position. Um, and I was really lucky to actually be partnered with someone who was a history librarian as well as the government documents librarian. Um, it just happened to be, you know, one of those nice lucky things that that kind of fell into my lap. Um, but that was really very important to me to have a mentor of some sort um, so I could ask her questions about how, again, she's navigated um, being a government documents librarian. So that was really helpful. So um, if there's ever a mentor program, it might be worth it to, you know, see, to see who you might be partnered with. Um, you never know how much they, they might be able to help you. Um, and then lastly, I kind of, I, I'm an organizational person, of course, so I, I kind of wrote down important events um, and important dates that I kind of needed to wrap my head around, um, especially for FDLP. There were a lot of dates and deadlines that kind of come up, um, special events like Constitution Day um, that I really was not that aware of before I took on this role. So I kind of made a calendar. I went through my Google calendar 
And I wrote down all of these important events and dates that I should be aware of. And then maybe I should proactively start um, creating programming for them or, or doing something to engage a little bit. So that was a lot for, for this particular slide. So I hope you're still with me. Now I'm going to talk a little bit um, about research questions. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on, on this slide uh, just in the interest of, of time. Um, but there are some, some helpful tips that I was given to kind of navigate these really kind of uh, difficult seeming research questions when I first was, was in, introduced into this role. Um, so the first thing that my predecessor told me, um, and that what, which I think is absolutely true, is that it can be really helpful if someone comes at you and they are looking for a particular report or if they're looking for something to locate and identify what department or agency is this coming from. Because once you identify that particular department or agency, then that helps you um, figure out what SUDOC number it is so that then you could go and track down that SUDOC number and see what publications are available or see, you know, where locate the publication from there. Um, you can figure out where records are being um, passed on to. You can figure out specific reports that are um, uh, being produced by those specific departments and agencies. So um, that I think is the first step um, in a lot of government information related questions. Um, I sometimes you already know that information, so you have a little bit of a leg up. Most of the time, no one's gonna tell you the SUDOC number, so you're gonna have to go and track that down. And so having the department or agency is, is very helpful. Um, titles can be very, very tricky, especially when they're in catalogs, because most of the time there are these, you know, the, the actual titles, titles are these like long five, five line um, titles. So it can be a little bit difficult to, to track down um, what you're looking for. Um, so I would encourage you to um, try, this, this sounds kind of funky, but to kind of try and think um, in the way of, of government publications. And, you know, all of them have these kind of like long um, wordy titles. It can sometimes be helpful to be a little bit too wordy in your search to track down um, particular titles. And that's definitely true if you don't have um, some of this additional information like the SUDOC number, or if you don't really know, if you're just kind of browsing through because you're interested in a, in a topic like forestry. Um, so it, it can be helpful to, to add a little bit more words to that. Um, I also say this because um, Hattie Trust has a really wonderful collection of government documents, um, but most of them are untitled or uncatalogued. And like, I'm, I'm, Literally, the title is like uncatalogued. Um, and then they have like numbers one through a thousand. So if you don't look at the metadata a little bit closely, more closely, you don't actually know what publication this is. And that's because a lot of institutions, when they would get the print, they would get these you know, little paper slivers of publications and then they would bind them together. Um, and oftentimes, those bound titles do not actually have a title. Um, so it, especially in how do you trust it's a little bit difficult to track down um, where uh, what you're looking at essentially. So that's why I kind of throw a little bit caution to the wind about titles. Um, and then of course, um, reaching out to the government documents community has been really, really important to me in my role this past year. I've reached out a number of times um, to just double check that I'm not, I'm answering the question as fully as I can. Um, also, I, I really want to, emphasize reaching out to other people because um, a lot of different institutions have done really amazing work or have collected specific um, government publications or government information collections that you might not know about. Um, so for example, I was looking for this particular publication um, that was related to um, chemistry and, and chemical engineering, um, and it was not um, in the usual place that I would have probably looked. Um, it was not in our catalog. It was, it was a little bit tricky to, to track down. Um, and it turns out that, that this one university in California had actually digitized most of those publications. Um, and I, we were able to do an interlibrary loan to get that particular report. And I would never ever have known that um, unless I had posted on the government documents listserv. 
um, because some retired government documents librarian said, I remember doing a digitization project with that particular report, we probably have it. Um, so use them as a resource. The other um, things that I have listed on the screen are just some databases and, and resources. Um, I realize that not everyone has, ha has access um, to all of these paid subscriptions, but I do just wanna mention um, some of the ones that we have at the University of Delaware that I, of course, use quite frequently. So those are the ones that are on the, the bottom half of the slides. Um, so Congressional Serial Set, which is through Redux, um, I use quite frequently, although it is a bit of a clunky interface. Um, so it, it's a little bit annoying, but uh, the Congressional Serial Set is in the process of being digitized. I think it's actually coming out this week, if I remember the date correctly. Um, so uh, there's another way of at least getting to, to that content um, elsewhere through GovInfo um, and other um, locations. Um, Hadi Trust, I mentioned, um, Law Library of Congress has a plethora of digitized um, government documents uh, content. They have such a, a lovely collection. And so I really encourage you to take a look. Um, they also have constitutions and treaties from First Nations. Um, so again, a, a really just a wonderful collection um, that uh, I don't think that many people know about. There is a webinar on the Law Library of Congress that I would encourage you to watch because I found out all the, the, this great information from, the, from them. Um, I, I use Hide Online quite frequently. Um, and ProQuest Correctional is really the place that I actually go to quickly track down SUDOC numbers. So there's, of course, other places that you can go to look um, up that information, um, but ProQuest Congressional um, kind of is, it's just a very quick interface that I've been able to navigate a little bit more easily. Um, it's also really great um, if you're looking for particular um, testimonies or hearings. Um, I've been able to look up particular witnesses um, related to different committees um, through this database, and I was able to track down um, that information a little bit more quickly than in other areas. Um, and we also have access to Nexus Uni and Westlaw, um, which are really great for Supreme Court hearings. Um, uh, but of course, those are two kind of more legal, Nexus Uni is a legal database, but um, it has a lot of legal casework and information. But I mentioned that the both of them, um, because they do have a really rich um, legislative history section, which um, a lot of my public policy students um, usually have to do some sort of legislative history um, within a number of their classes every single year. So those are some of the resources that I point them point them to. Um, and of course, GovInfo, I, I think I don't really need to explain it, but it's such a rich um, place to go and, and access a whole bunch of different information. Um, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. And I'm happy to, to answer more specific questions about any of those um, in the Q&A portion. So I've been, I've been telling you a lot of tips, um, but I also want to recognize that, um, you know, there are definitely some challenges this year and there are some things that I, as I reflect back on this first year um, that I had wish I had made more time for that um, I wish I had maybe known, known about. Um, so first of all, I, I wish I had made more time to read more founding publications on fundamental um, textbooks on government information. I really felt like I just, I didn't make the time for that. Um, and I wish that I did. I think having, again, I, as I mentioned before, having kind of a grounding and an understanding um, of, of the, the government publication world um, and government information world would have, um, I think, served me um, in a better capacity and um, maybe having a little bit more of an authoritative voice telling me um, some of the history of, of this and some tips and tricks. Um, that's something that is still still on my to do list to kind of broaden my, my horizon a little bit um, and hopefully become a better um, government documents librarian. Um, I also really wish that I had the opportunity to go through the physical collection before it was moved. Um, and I can still go to the annex location, but there kind of needs to be some finagling essentially um, for me to actually go to the annex location um, because it is of course locked and there's only one person who actually works there. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, my predecessor did move our physical location offsite. Um, so I don't have a physical 
government publication um, section in the library anymore. You can see the picture on the screen is actually what it used to look like and their shelves um, are now empty. We're getting in the, or we're kind of getting in the process of actually um, shifting our collection a bit. So that's why we had to move them off site. Um, so it's just, I'm a visual person. So being able to actually physically see what we have, see what makes our collection unique, um, would have really, really helped me. That's what I did with my other subject areas. Um, and I, I definitely would like to make more time, um, which kind of segues into my last point here. Um, I, all of us are so, so busy. All of us are wearing, you know, 5 million different hats. Um, and I really wish that I had done a better job of blocking off time on my calendar to actually sit and, you know, take more than an hour to watch a webinar, but sit through and kind of work through some of these, um, these resources that I would have liked to have gone through. Um, I'm very protective of my time that I spend at, at home. So I, you know, I'm happy to, to do some work when, once I get home. Um, but I, I do want to make sure that I'm maintaining a work-life balance. Um, so, you know, to me, it's not always realistic to come home and, and to read a textbook at night when I need a break from engaging with work every day. Um, so blocking off that time in your calendar, I really encourage you to do that if you can, um, and just make sure that you're giving yourself space um, to learn. Um, one thing that I did do that was really helpful is I told myself that on Fridays, which are usually my less busy days, um, I told myself that I would block off um, an hour to watch a webinar. So that's what I have been doing consistently. Um, so at least I, I do make some space for some additional professional development and learning. There we go. Um, so some of my goals going forward. So I just wanted to articulate some of what I'm thinking about um, in hopes that maybe that might encourage you to create some goals um, as you go forward in this role. Um, so first of all, we have um, a very large microform collection. We have both microfilm and microfiche. Um, and uh, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> I'm going to be very honest. It, there's really not that much information. There's not that much information that my predecessor passed down. Um, so I, my goal for this upcoming year is to take um, some time and actually assess the microform collection. Um, part of it, of course, is just for space. We have all of these filing cabinets that are filled with with microfiche, um, and I I don't and they're very rarely used. Um, so I would like to go through and kind of assess what we have in our collection, um, and and potentially make some decisions about about weeding. Um, we also have our 125th anniversary coming up, um, so I actually am going to be partnering with our special collections um, department to make um, a mini exhibition. Um, we want to pull in information, kind of larger government information across the state for our 20, 120th anniversary, 25th anniversary. Um, so I'm going to be planning that. And I'm very excited about this because I think it will give me a, an additional opportunity to learn about some of the really unique things that we have in our, in our collection that's unique to the, the University of Delaware and the state of Delaware. Um, the other thing that I want to do, and which I haven't done, so I encourage you to reach out to other government documents librarians or government information librarians, but I actually haven't reached out to any of the specific FDLP libraries in my state. Um, so again, I just want to make sure that I'm networking with my colleagues that are in my vicinity. Um, Delaware is quite small, as I'm sure you know. Um, so this is kind of a way for me to um, just connect and make sure that um, we're supporting each other in our work. Um, I'm also very concerned about kind of the national collection and the state collection of government documents. So um, I would like to, you know, have a little bit more of a conversation with them about what are you collecting? Is it the same as us? Is it different? How can we maybe collaborate in the future? Um, again, I, I think it's really important to, to make those connections um, across different institutions. Um, and just as a side note, I've also reached out to our legislative librarian um, that's housed in our um, uh, State Department. Um, so I've been talking to him too. And it's nice because he, again, has that background um, on the state level um, that has been helping me to kind of inform um, uh, the decisions and the documents that we have on, on a federal level. Um, and I also would really love to offer workshops. Right now we have 
no government information workshops. And I think it's a need that might be um, better fulfilled um, once I have a handle, a little bit more of a handle on, on uh, this rule and, and what we have. So I'm only gonna talk for another five minutes or so because I wanted to leave about 15 minutes or so for kind of conversation and, um, and questions. Um, so this is my last slide. So some FYIs and some takeaways. Um, I want to be very, very forthcoming with you that I, I think imposter syndrome is still alive and rampant in me, <laughs> um, especially when it comes to this position. Um, frankly, when I was asked to do this webinar, I was like, huh, do I have the knowledge to actually share with a group of first year government documents librarians about this? Um, you know, I, st I still have doubts about, uh, about my knowledge. I still don't think it's the way that it should or at the par of the level that it should be at. Um, but, you know, I'm working on it. Um, and, I, and I think that's kind of a, a lesson for all of us that we're all kind of a work in progress. We, you shouldn't expect to know everything um, right away. Uh, so give yourself a little bit of grace, give yourself a little bit of, of leeway and, and knowing your, your limits and then working on those limits. Um, so I do want to make sure that you're fully aware <laughs> that I definitely still feel like I am not officially a government documents li librarian, um, that I'm still kind of struggling through how, how do I navigate this world? How do I navigate these collections? Um, I'm, I'm still trying, trying my best. Um, um, the other thing that I do want to mention is to trust your instincts. Um, we're all trained librarians. We all have um, we all have skills and expertise that we're coming. So you know more than you think that you do. There have been many times that I've been you researching a, a, a government documents research question or government information research question, and I um, I'm like, this is totally wrong. I'm missing something. I'm definitely not doing something correctly. Um, and that at the time, I still had my, my predecessor here, so I was able to ask um, uh, specific help and advice on, on that particular question. And it turns out that I was, I was totally fine. I was doing it correctly. Um, so trust your instincts, trust that you know as a librarian what you're doing um, and, and kind of that you know how to, to follow the breadcrumbs, so to speak. Um, I think that's, again, a really good reminder for all of us that we, you know, we, have, we have some idea of what we're doing. It's okay. Um, you, you know more than you think. Um, and of course, um, as I've said many, many times, try to attend as many webinars, especially the help webinars, um, as you can. Um, they did not tell me to say this. I just am a really big fan of the help webinar series. I, it's helped, again, helped me a lot in this role. Um, and if you can't attend them, get the recording, sign up anyway. There are many recordings that I have kind of in my, on my back burner for one of those Fridays that I have um, some time to take. Um, so that is my presentation. I have my email up, so I'll keep that slide up there for a second. Um, but I really would love to hear from you. Are there any other tips that you have found um, over the course of your first year that you think everyone should know about. I would love to know because like I said, I'm still learning, um, but I'm, I'm very excited to, to hear from you and, and answer your questions if you have them. I just wanna say thank you so much, Caitlin, for presenting on this. I'm also like a relatively new government documents librarian and a lot of what you said resonated with my experience and, and things that I've done. And we definitely did not ask you to, to, to share your love of the webinar series, but since you have, I'm gonna go ahead and drop another link to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat, one or two in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to go to Jeff's question in the chat first. How do you access or transfer the physical documents in the Annex collection when they're needed? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so we have um, an Annex request form that our um, users are expected to fill out. And so that includes the public, of course, where we are, I don't think I mentioned this, we are open to the public. Um, so um, I have done my best to try and get people to actually look at our research guides beforehand so that they're aware that they have to request this material in advance. Um, so it's just a simple request form. Um, as long as it comes in before 1 p.m., they can get the information and the, the physical material that day. We're really close. It's like a five minute drive. Um, so we actually have a truck that goes back and forth um, so that when that form gets submitted, it gets sent to our um, annex worker, um, Peggy, and then Peggy 
gets all of the material on her little forklift, which is really cool. Um, and then she puts it in the in the truck and sends it over. If you get it to us after 1 p.m., then you have to get it the next day. But um, it's, a, it's a physical truck um, moving situation. And then they're free to use it um, wherever in the library. They just can't check any of the material out. Oh, interesting. OK, thank you. Yeah. And uh, Brooke also asks, do you have any book recommendations? I assume for kind of learning more about how to do this kind of a role. Yes, um, I do. And I'm going to just kind of finagle um, off screen so that I can grab my list um, and then type into my Google Drive government. Um, while I am doing that, um, is there another question? So I could pull that and I can pop that into the chat. Ah, sure. So uh, I'll turn to the Q&A. And Kimberly uh, says, great to hear from you. I also became a GovDocs librarian in 2019 rather spontaneously. I was wondering if you have a specific technical services person or persons working on the back end of GovDocs acquisitions, processing, and cataloging. And if so, could you describe that relationship? In our program, the GovDocs coordinator in tech services has been in that position for 15 plus years and has a lot of institutional memory, but she's not at all involved in public facing activities. Yes, yes, thank you for that question. Um, yes, yeah, so that actually is, is my experience as well. So we do have um, our acquisitions department. Uh, we have two people who are um, are cataloging our government material. Um, one of them just retired. So unfortunately we, we lost his institutional memory, but the other person has been doing this for, I think, I think 20 years. Um, so they also, they don't really have any um, uh, understanding of, of the public and, and those questions, but I find them really valuable. I have found them really valuable to talk to um, because they, they see more of the physical material than I do. Um, because you know they're they're ones that are actually handling it every day, and then because everything is in our annex location, they just automatically send it um, off to annex. Um, so I really very rarely see the the print publications that that come through, um, but they've been extremely helpful to kind of um, establish um, again that and the what are, what have our current collection development or previous collection development practices been. Um, are there things that are amiss that are sections that I maybe I forgot to order one year? Um, uh, they're, they're really amazing and they have a really fantastic memory for making sure um, that I'm on the right track and kind of checking me a little bit. Um, I do try and have a meeting. Um, I had one meeting with them last year, so I'm gonna try and continue that practice just so that we're you know, they tell me if there's anything amiss or um, if, you know, if anything has changed in, in that process. Um, did I answer that question fully? Yeah, yeah, I knew it was kind of about that relationship. And I, I think that that has been, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's great to have those relationships even, even within the library. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, yes, and Kimberly is also, uh, <laughs> affirmed that that was a, a good answer. I actually have a follow-up question of my own. Something that you mentioned when you were talking about the Annex uh, program that you have is that patrons are free to use the collection anywhere in the library but can't uh, check things out. Is, is your GovDocs collection entirely in library use only? And maybe if you could talk a little bit about how that works because I, I know in, in our collection, some is, some isn't, varies uh, institution to institution. Yeah, um, thank you. So uh, it's honestly, it depends on the, the publication. I would say majority mm. of our collection is only in-house, particularly the census data is definitely not allowed to be <laughs> um, taken out. Um, so we actually have little barcodes and security stickers on it so that, you know, if anyone tried to leave with the publication, um, it goes off um, and, you know, they'll be alerted. Um, but we are pretty upfront about um, once the annex material is officially, you know, transferred over to that person. Um, we're very upfront with our policies of, you know, this can only be read here. Um, you're free, of course, to make scans and photocopies. Um, at, you know, at, at will, but unfortunately you can't um, check them out. Um, I mean, also part of the, the issue with, you know, some of our um, publications not being checked out or 
rather I should say can be checked out is because we, since we are open to the public, um, we specifically have a public borrower card um, that not, that is, you have to pay into that card. Um, so not everyone has done that. So technically they would not be able to actually check out that material. So personally, you know, to make sure that we're not kind of alienating people or forcing them to have to pay for that public borrower card. Um, it, I think it's a little bit better to, to keep it in-house. Um, but uh, we've never really had a problem of having people run away with our, our government documents. So we do have that, that security system, but um, they are of course free to you know, use it anywhere in the library that they feel comfortable with. Right on, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, by the way, sorry, by the way, I, I did put two Amazon links to two um, books that I really liked um, in the chat. Um, I can also, if anyone emails me, I have a couple um, additional ones that are a little bit more specific to, to print publications as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm gonna kind of, oh. so we have a question from mm, Anna, let me. Uh, oh, I think I maybe I sent it to the posts and panelists, I'm sorry. Uh, I did that earlier with the links to our YouTube and my own email, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but while you're kind of maybe resending those, we have a question from Jack. Uh, right now, our library is suffering from large turnover and loss of student positions during the COVID period. Do you know of any particular training modules that can be adapted for training new GovDocs student assistants? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, for student assistance specifically. I mean, honestly, I, I think some of, I think that, and again, I'm not saying this just because I'm here, but the help webinars are very accessible. <laughs> um, and I, honestly, I think we just went through a program of treating student assistance and they, I, I think they can, you know, handle a little bit more than, than we give them credit for. So I think um, that would really be, um, my first, you know, stop <laughs> um, and recommendation. Um, I see that Linda just put in um, another uh, link in the chat. Like anything that has fundamental information. I know Ben's guide is very like kid focused, but it also might be kind of a fun way that college students might be able to to get into the the information. Um, and uh, you know, just at least like you know, be a little bit more um, accessible. Um, in terms of actual programs besides the webinar, um, I don't know of any off the top of my, my head. So I encourage if anyone else has any um, ideas, but I don't know of any that are specific to students. I know of some that are, you know, specific to first year government documents librarians, but it might be a little bit more than what you're, you're looking for. So I'm sorry, I don't have a, a better answer for that. No, I, mean, I think that's a, that's a great answer. And uh, seeing that link from Linda, I think that speaks to the uh, comment that you were making earlier about the community around GovDocs and how we all have links for each other in that way as well. Um, so I'm gonna vamp for a moment, uh, let some other questions maybe come in, let some people type. Um, Cause I did uh, mistype my email earlier. So uh, thank you again, Caitlin for being here uh, to talk about this and you know, for everyone, if there are topics that you wanna see or if you wanna recommend someone, uh, I know I was, we were able to ask Caitlin because she was recommended as, as a, a person who would have this kind of knowledge. Um, so I'm gonna drop my email in the chat again. Um, you should feel free to shoot me or, or Linda an email with the uh, suggestion that you might have. Um, and since I, I'll just ask one more of my own questions. Um, as you were kind of talking about going through those research questions, was there one where you kind of had a moment where you're like, oh wait, no, I've got this. Like, I know what I'm doing. I, when whether that was one where you were going through the, uh, the, that backlog, that back catalog of research questions, or whether that was one that you got live from, from somebody where you had that moment of, oh, I know what I'm doing. Like, I've got this job. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's a, a great question. So there, there was a, a gentleman who had gotten in touch with me um, about a very, very specific citation that he found on a book that like wasn't even being published anymore. And he was like, I'm trying to track down this citation. 
I, and I, unfortunately, I don't remember what it was, it was officially for, but, um, but it basically was like a Google book that he found this like vague citation to a hearing um, that he was interested in. Um, and I, I don't even know how I forget actually how I did it, um, but I was able to go into um, one of our databases professional or per quest uh, congressional and I was, you know, able to actually track down the hearing I was able to figure out exactly what it was. Um, just from this very terrible citation that actually wasn't a correct citation. Um, and that was kind of, it was a very valid <laughs> moment for me um, because I had, I was like, oh man, this is, I'm not gonna be able to do this. Like this is impossible. And I find, I actually was able to track down the document and I felt very good about myself. It was a life affirming, <laughs> life affirming research question. And I did it all by myself, which I also think it, you know, give yourself you know, a pat on the back when you get it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a great story. Thank you. Well, I am not seeing any uh, additional questions, but I, I did want to say thank you again for, for joining us and for presenting on your experience as a first year uh, government documents librarian. That was uh, super enlightening for me. I know I made a couple of notes of, of things that I want to check out myself, and there's a lot more thank yous coming in in the chat. Uh, and for all of our webinar participants, thank you all so much for joining us uh, on this fine Monday. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Best of luck. Let me know if you have questions. <laughs>